I'm here with Matthew Bishop from The Economist. Enjoy this session today. Aren't there some on Main Street in the United States who just believe we should have done nothing a year or two ago? No stimulus plan, no TARP plan, no bailouts. Uh, convenient to say, if we had done nothing, uh, would nothing have happened? So one of the things in my book, The Road from Ruin, that we look at is to go back in history to find out what happened when governments did do nothing. Mm. And what happens is that if you let the banking system fail, you get a much, much worse economic crisis than uh, if you step in to rescue the banking system. So back in uh, 1930, the American uh, government decided that its policy towards the banks would be liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. And as a result, you've got unemployment in the 20%, 25% level. So I think although it's unsavory to uh, let people who've taken reckless management decisions in the banking sector to uh, get out and uh, save their skins, but, uh, you know, actually that's the best thing for the public. When things get that bad, you've got to rescue the banking system. I think you referred in your presentation to additional stimulus that uh, might be needed. Um, is, is that a popular view in Washington now? And you, do you think that's something that will happen? Well, I think that as I said, that Washington needs to do two things at once. One is to stimulate more, and the other is to provide a credible plan for reducing the government deficit over the medium to long term. And I think Washington is aware that it needs to do both those things, but the politics there are so dysfunctional that they could end up doing uh, the opposite in both cases. They could end up, for political reasons, with the midterms coming out, uh, stopping the stimulate stimulus too soon and repeating the errors of the 1930s and, and in Japan in the 1990s and they could completely fail to come up with a plan for actually addressing the long-term fiscal problems and we could end up with not only a bad uh, recession but also uh, inflation risks uh, rising as the deficit gets bigger and bigger. Matt, you referred to a Bretton Woods 2.0 for those who are not uh, good with their history. What happened at Bretton Woods and why do we need a, a second one? So at Bretton Woods after the Second World War, America gathered the leaders of the other uh, major economies together and said we need to design rules for the global economy, we need to create new institutions like the IMF uh, and also the idea of the Marshall Plan to aid the reconstruction uh, of the war affected economies uh, came soon after that. Um, and I think that was the one moment in the history of the world where uh, the global economies have come together and actually acted in an enlightened, long-term way to build a better global economy. And at the moment, we're in a global economic crisis, and there's a real danger that um, the governments of the world will uh, focus inwardly rather than an outwardly on building a better uh, system for the global economy. And America, I think, should host another Bretton Woods, Bretton Woods 2.0, where they bring together the other economic powers, including countries like China and India, and say, look, we need to modernize the system, we need to build a better set of global rules, a better set of global institutions. And you talked about fundamental reform. Even if there were fundamental reform, aren't there certain things in terms of the dislocation of the American economy or globalization such that Americans in some ways have to get used to a different form of economic life or a different position in the global economy than they were before? Well, two things. One is that when you get drunk on debt, like when you get drunk on alcohol, you're going to have a hangover the next day. And there's a while that America, the American economy is going to be feeling sickly because it just took on too much debt and it has to get off that debt. Uh, the other hand, though, if, if, if reform is done in Washington, major reforms, I think you can get the economy growing again relatively soon. Uh, but those reforms aren't happening at the moment. The other uh, issue is that America clearly will become less dominant in the global economy than it's been in the past because economies like China's and India's are growing. So just the law of mathematics means that as they get bigger and they're going to grow faster because they're less well off, um, America will be less significant and it has to adjust to that new world where it's not the superpower anymore but there's, it's one of many powerful economies. Speaking of adjusting to the new world, writers are also adjusting to the new world. You talked about what you're planning to write in the Huffington Post. Mm. How do you see yourself as a sort of content producer? I mean, at one time you might be a magazine writer for The Economist, certainly a distinguished uh, position. Now you sort of have your own brand. You're writing books and you uh, produce things on the web and for The Economist and speak at conferences. How do you look at yourself differently than a writer uh, might have looked at uh, himself 10 or 20 years ago? Well, for me, the, you know, the Economist is bucking the trends in the industry as a whole, and, and our circulation continues to grow. It's rising in America, and people still want to read The Economist in print as well as online. So in some ways, there's been no change, and in fact, things have got better 
because I think people have a thirst to know what's going on in the world, and that's what we write about. Mm. But I think also, um, increasingly, as a, as a writer, I want to do books that actually allow me to get that bit deeper than you can get in a magazine article. And because of the internet, we're able to contact all sorts of people that we mm-hmm. and reach audience we weren't able to do before. I mean, I Twitter now. I, mm-hmm. I'm at Matt Bish, M-A-T-T-B-I-S-H, and mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I reach a whole different audience through that. Right. And likewise through websites and things like that and through doing media like this, mm-hmm. which wouldn't have been possible ten years ago. So what that means is it's great is that if you have an idea and if you have a news story, you can actually reach many more people through many different mm-hmm. channels. And I think, although it's uncomfortable for some in the industry, as we make that transition, some old business models are going to go out of business. Mm-hmm. Overall, it's, for those of us that uh, you know, have figured out how to make it work, it's a great opportunity. Matt Bishop from The Economist, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.